Hey guys, I'm Kirsten Parrish, and today we're going to be talking about Order Artiodactyla and all the creatures within it. So this order is divided into three suborders with at least one family within each suborder. These creatures are really defined by their paraxonic limb structure, and that just means the, um, the line of symmetry between the third and fourth tarsals. And so if you'll hang with me, I'll fill you in on all the details about these awesome creatures. The first known members of the order Arteodactyla appeared suddenly throughout the whole Arctic region at the beginning of the Eocene. Appearing as rabbit-sized members of the Diacodexidae, newly discovered fossils place these early Arteodactyls in Europe and Asia during the early Eocene. The Eocene epoch, lasting from 56 to 33.9 million years ago, according to evolution, is the second epoch of the Paleogene period in the Cenozoic era. Molecular genetic DNA data strongly support the hypothesis that Hippopotamidae is a sister group to cetaceans and place the remaining even-toed ungulates in a separate clade. The term C. tartiodactyla is used to indicate the shared ancestry of artiodactyls and cetaceans. Today, however, most mammologists support the hypothesis of a C. tartiodactyla clade that includes the cetacea and artiodactyla as separate clades. Members of artiodactyla are the most diverse, large, terrestrial mammals alive today. The fifth largest order of mammals, artiodactyla consists of 10 families, 89 genera, and approximately 240 species to date. Although the majority of artiodactyls live in relatively open habitats, they are found in all habitat types, including some aquatic systems. They are also native to every continent, excluding Australia and Antarctica. Artiodactyls also exhibit remarkable variation in body size and structure. For example, body mass ranges from 4,000 kilograms in the hippo to 2 kilograms in the lesser melee mouse deer. Height also ranges extensively, from 5 meters in the giraffe to 23 centimeters in the lesser melee mouse deer. Suiforms includes the suids, tyosuids, and hippos, including a number of extinct families. These animals do not ruminate and their stomachs may be simple and one-chambered or have up to three chambers. Their feet are usually four-toed with metatarsals and metacarpals unfused. They have bunyodont cheek teeth and tusk-like canines. The family Hippopotamidae is represented today by two genera, Hippopotamus and Hexaprotodon, with each genus having an exclusive species within it. As previously noted, Hippopotamidae is often considered a sister taxa with Cetacea, with the two families collectively named Cetancodonta. Sorry, that was hard to say. <laughs> Members of Hippopotamidae are bulky creatures, weighing 180 to 2300 kilograms, depending on genus, with large heads and short limbs. The genera are very different in size, and most of the physiological characteristics distinct to this family are due to their amphibious mode of living. For example, specialized skin glands secrete an oily substance that protects the sparsely haired body from exposure to the sun, as well as harmful microbes. Their tails are short and tufted, and they have broad and square mouths. Hippopotami are gregarious, with groups spending much time of the day in water. Good swimmers and divers, hippos are able to walk on the bottom of rivers or lakes using a slow-paced gait when submerged. Mating, birth, and much of calf rearing, including suckling, takes place in the water. Hippos have been observed to communicate by the production of a wide variety of sounds, some of their underwater sounds resembling the sonar clicks of dolphins. Their low-frequency grunts are transmitted simultaneously through the air and water, allowing hippos to communicate across the water barrier over, for over several kilometers. The conservation status of hippos remains precarious, and the need for direct conservation act in action to protect hippos and hippo habitat across their range is a priority. Swine are omnivorous and lack many structural modifications typical of more specialized artiodactyls. There are 18 recent species in five genera. Most suids resemble domestic swine, typically having thick, sparsely haired skin. One of the most notable characteristics of suids is the mobile snout, which has a cartilaginous disc at its tip and terminal nostrils. The large canines are ever-growing, and the upper canines form conspicuous tusks that protrude from the lips and curve upward. 
All four digits have hooves, but these are only functional in locomotion on the middle digits, as the smaller lateral digits are located higher on the limb. Most suids are gregarious and some assemble in groups of up to 50 individuals. They chiefly inhabit forested or brushy areas and eat a broad array of food and carrion, even killing and eating animals such as small rodents and snakes. They have a two-chambered stomach and do not ruminate. Warthogs, however, favor savanna or open grassland and are almost entirely herbivorous. They are fairly swift and escape their predators by speed and taking refuge in burrows. Suids, especially hogs, says Scrofa, have been introduced into a number of places, usually as a game species. Unfortunately, in some areas they have caused significant environmental damage by their foraging and carry several transmittable diseases, as we learned from Dr. Newman during our first field lab, when that one pig wouldn't die. Tojin Island's Bebarusa was listed as endangered in 2016 because of its extent of occurrence is diminished. Its distribution is severely fragmented and there is continuing decline in the extent and quality of its habitat. The pygmy hog was listed as critically, critically endangered in 200, hmm, 2008 because its population size is estimated at less than 250 mature individuals and is continuing to decline. Tyasuids are pig-like animals that are found in the southwestern United States and south-central Argentina. Tyasuids, usually called peccaries or javelinas, are restricted to the New World. Much smaller than suids, peccaries are covered with coarse grayish or brownish fur, and all species have contrasting areas of white or yellowish fur on their chests, back, or faces. The canines are long, sharp, and directed slightly outward. These opposing canines slide against one another, forming occlusal guides that stabilize the, the jaw joint. The stomach has two or three chambers and is non-ruminating, but it is more complex than in stewards. In addition, all three genera have a scent gland on the rump, which is used in social communication. Peccaries occupy diverse habitats, from deserts to pinyon juniper foothills in Arizona, to dense tropical forests and thorn shrub in southern Mexico. Despite their chunky build, peccaries are fairly rapid and extremely agile runners. Gregarious animals, peccary group size ranges from a few animals to several hundred. They forage during the day, feeding on a wide variety of plant and animal materials. Peccaries' presence is often indicated by shallow excavations where roots have been exposed beneath bushes or patches of prickly pear cactus. Peccaries in general are of moderate concern as in regards to conservation and should be monitored for potential population endangerment. For example, the Chicoan peccary was listed as endangered in 2015 because of a serious population decline. The collared peccary, pictured, was listed as least concern in 2011 as this species is widely distributed in a variety of habitats and the white-lipped peccary was considered vulnerable in 2013 under criteria due to an ongoing population reduction in recent generations due to habitat loss, illegal hunting, competition with livestock, and epidemics. The suborder Tylopoda contains a single living family, Camelidae. Modern tylopods have a three-chambered ruminating stomach. Although their third and fourth metapodials are fused near the body, the navicular and cuboid bones of the ankle are not fused, a primitive condition that separates tylopods from the third order, third suborder, excuse me, ruminantia. Camelids are ruminants that are restricted to arid and semi-arid regions. There are two groups of living camels. One group contains the dromedary, one-humped camel, and bactrian, two-humped camel, found in northern Africa and Central Asia, but existing today exclusively in domestication. The other group contains the South American llamas, alpacas, guanacos, and vicuñas. Guanacos and vicuñas still exist in the wild, although wild populations are threatened. The camelid foot was already highly specialized by the Oligocene, nearly ungulligrade in posture and didactyl, the distal most phalanges probably bearing hooves. This adaption enables effective support on soft, sandy soil, giving a desirable trait to this species. 
Camelids are the last derived living ruminants. General, generally gager, gregarious, <laughs> camelids live in small social groups dominated by an adult male. Males fight for dominance by biting and neck dominance. All camelids are herbivorous and feed primarily on grasses. Guanacos are fairly speedy runners, especially adroit at moving over rapidly rough terrain. Camels are remarkably well adapted to arid areas. They can survive with little water for months. They allow their body temperature to rise 6 degrees Celsius during the day. They have specialized navel, nasal cavities that reduce water loss. They store fat in their humps during food storages. And their woolly fur provides excellent insulation in lower temperatures. Looking at the conservation aspect, Bactrian camel was ass assessed as critically endangered in 2008. Guanaco was considered to be of least concern in 2016, and Vicuña was considered to be least concern in 2008 due to estimated large populations, wide range, and occurrence in a number of protected areas. And isn't this little picture of an alpaca cute? Aww. Suborder Ruminantia includes giraffes, deer, antelope, sheep, goats, and cattle. In general, these animals are committed strictly to an herbivorous diet and to highly cursorial locomotion. The four-chambered stomach is also a key characteristic in almost all species. For the family Antilocapridae, we're going to be talking about that one first, this family is represented today by one species, the pronghorn, which occupies open country from central Canada to north central Mexico. To contrast to the family Cervidae, the cores of their antlers are never shed, and both sexes have horns. Also, the prominent or orbits are situated high and far back in the skull. The pronghorn is unique, the only one to annually shed its horn sheaths, which are made of keratinized skin. Pronghorn have hypsodont, selenodont cheek teeth. As in deer and members of the family Bovidae, the upper incisors are replaced by a horny pad and the lower canine is incisor-like. The pronghorn is extremely swift because of muscular and respiratory adaptations that provide for extremely rapid and prolonged oxygen uptake. This includes enlarged airways to the lungs, greater lung surface areas, higher concentrations of hemoglobin, and greater densities of muscle capillaries and mitochondria. All of these contribute to its great speed capability. Second only to the cheetah and swiftness, the pronghorn speed is its most effective survival tool. Antelope caprids form small herds during the summer, but form groups of around 100 individuals in the winter. Their herds have a well-developed social hierarchy with a polygynous breeding system. Their habitat includes open prairies and deserts that support density of low grasses, shrubs, and forbs. Antilocapra americana, or pronghorn, was listed as least concerned in 2016 as the species remains widespread and relatively common within its range, with a population estimated at, a one, at around 1 million animals. The family Bovidae is the most commercially important and most diverse living group of ungulates, occurring throughout Africa, Europe, Asia, and North America. Their dentition, ungulagrade, hooved, limb morphology, and gastrointestinal specialization likely evolved as a result of their grazing lifestyle. All bovids have four chambered, ruminating stomachs and at least one pair of horns, generally present on both sexes. Bovids are obligate herbivores, having hypsodont and selenodont tooth morphology. The upper incisors absent and the upper canines either reduced or absent. The dental pad replaces the upper incisors and provides a surface for gripping plant materials. Open habitat species have long forelimbs that increase stride length, and some even have bold color patterns or stripes. These adaptations help bovids evade poten potential predators through the various mechanisms of hiding, escaping, or confusion, as exemplified in the stripes of a zebra, which serve to make the animal appear bigger to predators. Many bovids are gregarious and form large herds. Generally, herds are led by a single dominant male, and the horns are frequently used in fights between males during the breeding season. Gotta show off to get that female and eliminate your competition, not to mention. 
Many bovid species also migrate according to proximal clues, cues, such as photoperiod. These cues serve as indicators for various seasonal changes, which can affect the abundance of pests, predators, and forage. Bovids first evolved as a grassland species, and most extant species are often grassland inhabitants. Sorry, are open grassland inhabitants. Currently, many bovid species enjoy sufficient numbers to ensure their survival for years to come. The ICUN Red List of Threatened Species considers 67 of the 143 species to be least concern, due in part to the protection of large tracts of land that help offset the detrimental effects of habitat loss. And I just get a picture. I get a kick out of this picture of Cape Buffalo. They're just glaring at you. So funny. The family Cervidae, commonly referred to as the deer family, consists of 23 genera containing 47 species and includes the muntjacks, deer, elk, caribou, and moose. This family originally occurred through most of the New World and in Europe, Asia, and northwestern Africa, but have inter been introduced widely elsewhere. For example, deer are actually very abundant in my housing community in Granbury, Texas where we sustain a big pecan tree orchard, so they are drawn to that. Antlers are the most widely recognized characteristic of members of the family Cervidae. Branched and horn-like, these structures are lost and grown anew annually and only occur in males, except in caribou. In some antlered cervids, the upper canines are retained but reduced. Some species are gregarious for much of the year and may assemble in large herds during the winter and during migratory movements. Although active throughout most of the day, cervids are considered crepuscular, or active at twilight. Species living in seasonal climates spend most of their time during the winter and early spring resting, as forage during this time is limited and of poor quality. During late spring, however, when fresh forage is available, Deer spend less time resting and significantly, significantly increase their activity rates. In mating season, males often scrape the ground with their forelimbs to advertise their presence and availability to potential mates. Cervids live in a variety of habitats, ranging from the frozen tundra of northern Canada and Greenland to the equatorial rainforests of India. They inhabit deciduous forests, wetlands, grasslands, scrublands, and rainforests, being particu particularly well suited for boreal and alpine ecosystems. Effective insulation is provided in many cervids by the long, hollow hairs of the pelage. Of the 55 species of cervidae listed on IUCN's Red List of Threatened Species, two are listed as extinct, one as critically endangered, 8 as endangered, 16 as vulnerable, and 17 as least concern. Major threats for cervids includes exploitation due to hunting, habitat loss, and resource competition with domestic and invasive animals. This is my favorite family because I love giraffes. They're my spirit animal. Relatively slow and funny looking. So this family is represented today by two monotypic genera, Giraffa and Ocapia, occurring in much of Africa south of the Sahara. Giraffids are large, Ocapis, to huge giraffes, also me. They have long, narrow heads, thin lips, and long tongues. Ocapis lack, however, the extraordinary long neck and legs of giraffes, also me. They resemble a dark brown horse with a long neck and horizontal white stripes on the legs, as shown in the picture. Males have hair-covered horns up to 15 centimeters in length that project rearward from the frontal bones. Despite their considerable weight, also me, giraffes can gallop for short distances up to 60 kilometers per hour. Relative to those of lighter, shorter-limbed artiodactyls, the limbs of giraffes are flexed little during each stride, producing a stiff-legged gait. Ocapis and giraffes are very different in their ecology and behavior. Ocapis inherit the deep forests of Central Africa. They're solitary animals with relatively small home ranges. Their diet includes mostly browse and they also graze on grasses. Giraffes, however, are gregarious, living in herds of up to 25 animals, which occur large home ranges 
usually in relatively open savannas. Their eyesight is excellent, Okapis not so much, and they're exclusively browsers, using their long necks to reach into the crowns of trees to feed. Giraffa camelopardalis giraffe, was assessed as vulnerable in 2016. Some giraffe populations are stable or increasing, while others are declining, and each population is subject to threats specific to their region. However, the species trend reveals an overall large decline in numbers across their range in Africa. Okapia johnstoni Okapi, have been undergoing a decline since 1995 that is projected to continue in the face of intensifying threats and lack of conservation action. And isn't this little picture of the giraffe and its baby cute? Ugh. The family Moshidae includes a single genus and seven species. Musk deer are similar to cervids in many respects and are often classified as a subfamily of cervidae. They have coarse fur with hind limbs longer than the forelimbs. They lack antlers but have saber-like upper canines. As their name implies, musk deer males have a musk gland in the abdomen that secretes a waxy substance commercially used as a base for expensive perfumes, soaps, and medicine, one of the main threats against their population densities. While musk deer share some characteristics with cervids, they have defining characteristics, such as the fact that both sexes of musk, musk deer lack antlers. When pursued, these animals make huge leaps with radical changes of direction and are so agile as to be able to forage. Musk deer are secretive animals, generally active at night, in the early morning, or in late evening, usually solitary. Their diet includes both browse and graze, and they also consume some mosses and lichens. The musk, musk deer prefer gentle to sleep s steep slopes <laughs> with the altitudinal range of 3,400 to 3,900 meters, and also display a preference for dense forest and sparse ground, or crown cover. Because of extensive hunting, musk deer populations have declined rapidly, and all species are listed as threatened or vulnerable. And I just think they look so silly with those big tusks coming out of their mouths. <laughs> This last family, the family Tragulidae, which contains the chevrotains or mouse deer, has only three living genera with eight species, but they are of interest because they are the least derived extant ruminants and probably resemble the ancestors of other ruminants in many ways. Although apparently related to more derived ruminants, chevrotains combine a unique complex of features. The skull never bears antlers, but the upper canines are tusk-like and are used by males in intraspecific combat. Otherwise, the dentition resembles that of higher ruminants. Mouse deer earn their common name from their diminutive size. Their coats are bicolored, brown on the dorsal and white on the ventral side, with white spots and stripes scattered across the coat. Tragulids are secretive, solitary, nocturnal creatures that inhabit forests and underbrush and thick growth along watercourses. They are primarily herbivorous, feeding on grasses, leaves, and some fruit, but they also eat invertebrates, small mammals, and even sometimes carrion. Males fight over females using their sharp canines, and interestingly, the throat and rump in both sexes are protected from tusk wounds by thick skin and deep muscles. Chevrotains mostly communicate through scent marks and vocalizations. When frightened, they make soft bleeding sounds. When fighting, they emit a high-pitched chatter and even scream when wounded. Chevrotains also mark their home territory with scent marks of urine, feces, or glandular secretions. Doesn't that sound nice? Sadly, I was unable to find a recording of these noises to include in this presentation. The combination of their shy, flighty behavior, small size, and their nocturnal activity patterns makes these animals especially difficult to study. Therefore, knowledge of the status of the chevrotain species is not satisfactory. The Balabac species, however, is the only chevrotain listed by the IUCN Red List as endangered, with almost all other chevrotains evaluated as least concern in 2016.
Thanks for joining me for this discussion about Order Artiodactyla and all the amazing creatures within it. I hope that this presentation sparked your interest, answered your questions, and even gave you a new appreciation for animals that you didn't know existed before. Um, you should check out the links below to learn more about how you can be involved in the observation and conservation of these awesome creatures. Thanks.